Hello guys and welcome again to another Nursing Essentials video. In today's video, we'll review hypertension. This is important because heart disease is the leading cause of death for both men and women. Many of you may have already heard about this silent killer that affects about 85 million Americans. That's one out of every three adults over the age of 20. And only about 54% of them have the disease under control. Around the world, that number may be as much as 1 billion individuals. Most people with high blood pressure have no signs or symptoms, even if blood pressure readings reach dangerously high levels. A few people with high blood pressure may have headaches, shortness of breath, or nosebleeds, but these signs and symptoms are not specific and usually don't occur until high blood pressure has reached a severe or life-threatening stage. Mortality rates are higher in women with a 55.2% compared to where 44.8% found in men. To understand hypertension, we must understand blood pressure. Let's do a quick recap of blood pressure. Also, make sure you check out the NCLEX practice question at the end of the video. Let's get started with blood pressure. Blood pressure is defined as a pressure of circulating blood on the walls of blood vessels. It is one of the vital signs along with the respiratory rate heart rate, oxygen saturation, and body temperature. Take this blood vessel for example. In arteries, the blood is going to flow in one direction, in this case away from the heart. As blood passes through the vessel, it exerts pressure on the walls of the vessel. This is what we call blood pressure. The resistance offered by the blood vessel to the flow of blood is what we call vascular resistance. Blood pressure is always measured in millimeters of mercury. When taking blood pressure readings, it will look something like this. 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. The first number and the highest belongs to the systolic pressure, or the maximum during one heartbeat. The second number, and the smallest, belongs to the diastolic pressure, or minimum between two heartbeats. They are always measured in millimeters of mercury. On November of 2017, the standards for blood pressure changed. Let's take a look at the new blood pressure classification. For normal, we now have readings of systolic blood pressure from 80 to 120 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic of 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. For elevated, which used to be prehypertension, we now have readings of systolic blood pressure of 120 to 129 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic of 80 or less millimeters of mercury. Stage 1 hypertension now has readings of systolic pressure of 130 to 139 millimeters of mercury or diastolic pressure of 80 to 89 millimeters of mercury. Stage 2 hypertension now has readings of systolic pressure of 140 or higher millimeters of mercury or diastolic of 90 or higher millimeters of mercury. There are two other types of hypertensive conditions that you should know. One is preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a pregnancy complication characterized by high blood pressure and signs of damage to another organ system, most often the liver and kidneys. The second is a hypertensive emergency called malignant hypertension. Malignant hypertension is a condition in which elevated blood pressure results in target organ damage. Hypertensive urgency must be distinguished from hypertensive emergency. Urgency is defined as severely elevated blood pressure with no evidence of target organ damage. Unless intervention occurs promptly, a patient with malignant hypertension may experience renal failure left ventricular failure or stroke. Four major control systems play a major role in maintaining blood pressure. Number one, baroreceptors. These pressure sensors located primarily in the carotid sinus, aorta, and the wall of the left ventricle relay information to the brain so that proper blood pressure can be maintained. They counteract a rise in blood pressure by slowing the heart rate and promoting hormone secretions that target the blood vessel's smooth muscle to produce vasodilation. Number two is fluid volume regulation. 
Changes in fluid volume also affect the systemic arterial pressure. For example, if there's an excess of sodium or water in the person's body, the blood pressure would rise. If the kidneys are working correctly, a rise in systemic arterial pressure would produce diuresis or excessive voiding. By controlling sodium and water excretion, the body is able to lower blood pressure. Number three, we have the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. I won't get into much detail because I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed. Just keep in mind that the kidneys produce an enzyme called renin that acts on angiotensin to promote the formation of a protein called angiotensin 1, which is converted by another enzyme in the lungs to form angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor of all blood vessels. It acts on the smooth muscle by raising vascular resistance, which in turn raises blood pressure. This system is usually activated by a decrease in arterial blood pressure that could be related to a decrease in blood volume. Number four, vascular autoregulation. This process that keeps perfusion of tissues in the body relatively constant appears to be important in causing hypertension. However, the exact mechanism of how this system works is not fully understood. Let's take a look at this example of arteries and veins. Remember, because of their composition, arteries are made to handle pressure. The tunica media, which is made up of smooth muscle and elastic tissue, gives arteries a capability to reduce or increase their diameter depending on the body's needs. Veins, on the other hand, are equipped to handle volume. Let's look at this example of how vessel radius affects blood pressure. The vessel to your left has a smaller radius, which would increase vascular resistance, which in turn increases blood pressure, similar to what you would see in vasoconstriction. The vessel to your right has a bigger radius, thus decreasing the vascular resistance, which in turn decreases blood pressure, similar to what you would see in vasodilation. When the force of blood against the artery walls is too high, we call it hypertension. By definition, hypertension is systolic pressure at or above 140 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure at or above 90 millimeters of mercury in people who don't have diabetes. There are two types of hypertension. Number one, primary, also called essential hypertension, is high blood pressure that doesn't have a known secondary cause. For most adults, there is no identifiable cause of high blood pressure. This type of blood pressure, called primary or essential, tends to develop gradually over many years. The second type is secondary hypertension. Some people have high blood pressure caused by an underlying condition. This type of high blood pressure, called secondary hypertension, tends to appear suddenly and causes higher blood pressure than primary does. Various conditions and medications can lead to secondary hypertension. Understanding the risks associated with hypertension can help you create a better plan of care for your client. These risks include age, family history, race, stress, being physically inactive, obesity, tobacco and alcohol consumption, too much sodium in the diet, and too little potassium in the diet, and hyperlipemia. Essential hypertension can develop when a patient has one or more of these risk factors. Secondary hypertension can be produced by chronic kidney disease, coarctation of the aorta, Cushing's syndrome, obstructive uropathy, pheochromocytoma, primary aldosteronism, renovascular hypertension, sleep apnea, thyroid or parathyroid disease. These are just some of the possible causes of secondary hypertension. If left untreated, hypertension can cause severe system complications, such as cerebrovascular accidents, hypertensive enteropathy, elevated sugar levels, hypertensive retinopathy, myocardial infarction, hypertensive cardiomyopathy, and hypertensive nephropathy. 
Diuretics are the first type of drug for managing hypertension. Three basic types of diuretics are used to decrease blood volume and lowering hypertension. The first type belongs to the family of thiazide diuretics, or low ceiling diuretics, such as hydrochlorothiazide, which you may find as hydrodiuryl, microcide, uroside, and uretic. These type of diuretics inhibit sodium, chloride, and water reabsorption in the distal tubules while promoting potassium, bicarbonate, and magnesium excretion. However, they decrease calcium excretion which helps prevent kidney stones and bone loss. Because of the low cost and effectiveness of thiazide diuretics, they are the drug of choice for treating hypertension. The second type belongs to the family of loop diuretics, or high ceiling, such as furosemide, which you may see as Lasix and furicide, and torsemide, which you may find as Demedex. They inhibit sodium, chloride, and water reabsorption, this time in the ascending loop of Henle, and promote potassium excretion. Loop diuretics are more effective in patients with impaired kidney function. The third type belongs to the family of potassium sparing diuretics, such as spironolactone, which you may find as aldactone and novospiriton, triamterine, which may be found as diurenium, and amyloride, such as metamor. They act on the distal renal tubule to inhibit reabsorption of sodium in exchange for potassium, thereby retaining potassium in the body. When used, they're usually combined with another diuretic to conserve potassium. Frequent voiding caused by any type of diuretic may interfere with daily activities. Teach your client to take diuretics in the morning rather than night to prevent nocturia. The most frequent side effect associated with thiazide and loop diuretics is hypokalemia. Monitor serum potassium levels and assess for irregular pulse and muscle weakness. Teach patients who are taking these types of diuretics to eat foods high in potassium such as bananas and orange juice. For patients taking potassium sparing diuretics, such as pyrenolactone, you must assess for hyperkalemia. Be on the lookout for muscle twitching, numbness, decreased heartbeat, and hypotension. Lastly, let's review an NCLEX style question. A nurse is planning to administer hydrochlorothiazide to a client. The nurse understands that which of the following are concerns related to the administration of this medication? Option A, hypouricemia and hyperkalemia. Option B, increased risk of osteoporosis. Option C, hypokalemia, hyperglycemia, and sulfa allergy. Option D, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, and penicillin allergy. If you know the right answer, leave it in a comment below, along with a brief description explaining why you picked that answer. That's it for today, guys. Make sure you subscribe and hit the like button. We have more topics and questions on the way. Bye for now.